Good evening and welcome to What's Now San Francisco. Uh, my name is Joe Bojo. I'm with a company called Cap Gemini, and you're in our facility called the Applied Innovation Exchange. I'll give you a little flavor as to what that thing is in a second, but before I do that, I wanted to ask you all uh, a couple of questions. So how many What's Now San Francisco first timers do we have? Solid, all right. How many rocket scientists do we have? That's about as many. How many astronauts do we have? <laughs> Two, all right, that's a record, yeah. Well, we're honored to have you. Uh, so back a little bit to who's Capgemini, what's the Applied Innovation Exchange. So Capgemini is a global consultancy based out of Paris, uh, about 200,000 employees. And this is our Applied Innovation Exchange. It's one of 11 around the world. And what we do here is we host our clients, who are typically Fortune 500 companies that are struggling with a whole host of different issues from uh, digital transformation to business model reinvention to you know, culture change. And we immerse them here in this space, as well as the, the region of Silicon Valley, to facilitate an exchange and help them get exposed to technologies and cultures and processes to help them confront their challenges. And on the back end, we help them to apply the innovation that they get exposed to while they're here. And uh, the history of this concept of what's now San Francisco is about two years old now. And uh, started with Pete and I and a few others having lunch next door at, at Koh Samui. And when we originally conceived of the idea, it was really you know, how do we start to introduce ourselves into the community of Silicon Valley in a authentic, meaningful way and bring together a community of interesting people on interesting subjects from robotics to AI to this evening uh, space and, and a really fascinating subject matter that we're gonna endeavor into tonight. So uh, thank you all for joining us and I will hand it over to our partner from reInvent, Pete Layden, to uh, take it from here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, uh, Cap Gemini, for hosting and having this fantastic space here. I'm Pete Lydon. I'm the founder of reInvent. reInvent's a media company based here in San Francisco. And what we kind of think of ourselves as doing is always trying to find remarkable innovators who are transforming their field and actually trying to figure out better ways forward. And um, we do that by getting them in deep conversations um, about what's coming next, where things are going, and we try to open that up to larger audiences. Um, and in fact, uh, this project here, or this series, which we're doing with Capgemini, is, does that in spades. And what we've basically been doing is every month for the last two years, we've been going to a different area that's kind of exploding in innovation in the Bay Area here. And we get somebody remarkable to say, hey, what is really going on in that field that everyone should really know about? What's really happening? What's really important? But also, what are the challenges that you're wrestling with now? Not the things you have all figured out in your canned talks, but basically, what are you grappling with right now? And then we bring together an audience, and you guys are the most, as important as a speaker here, of folks from that field who actually have differing perspectives on that. Also, people from other fields who are kind of coming in with an innovative angle from a different discipline. And we basically have a deep conversation over the course of the next 90 minutes. We open this up to all kinds of folks over video here. This is live streamed as it goes here. Uh, and in fact, we're setting something of a record here today. There is a, a guy, a scientist in Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean who is watching this at 6.30 in the morning uh, <laughs> for breakfast, he said. And... Uh, Quite a few folks actually are quite interested in this conversation. They're basically coming in and watching this live. We also edit it and later you can get it up there. For those who are doing anything with social media, try to use the hashtag What's Now San Francisco, any photos or whatever, we'll kind of pull it all together.
Now, one of the things about this series, which is so exciting, is every month we get something kind of, again, a new space. And we've been wanting for the longest time to do space. In fact, this is the original logo, and we've had uh, one of the connecting up all these different disciplines. And space has been sitting down there, and we haven't done it now for two years. And we've said, wow, it's about time we really get our heads into that. And one of the things is we didn't really know exactly how to tap into who we should we have to really explain what's going on there. And so we then contacted our friends at the... Uh, the B612 Asteroid Institute, Danica Remy and, and uh, Ed Liu here, and we basically were saying, um, who in your network would be kind of the up and coming kind of next generation entrepreneurs who are kind of breaking open a new generation of space, a new kind of opening up a different era of space? And they said, they gave us, they turned us on to Johnny Dyer, who's going to be leading this conversation today. Now, Johnny is kind of, he's like the real deal. You know, he's the kid from Texas who was blowing shit up in his backyard when he was a kid. <laughs> he goes to Stanford, uh, gets a mechanical engineering degree. He did sm stints as he was kind of coming in his early career there at uh, Elon, Elon Musk at SpaceX, Jeff Bezos' Blue Horizon, uh, the Space Propulsion um, what is it, Space Propulsion Lab? But basically, uh, then he actually got into the founding team of uh, uh, Skybox Imaging. And Skybox Imaging is a, one of these kind of next generation plays here that really is opening a new thing in space. Uh, it was a 2009 launch. It had 100 million bucks in venture money, not government money, but venture money. And uh, they were essentially up to get a, a lot more uh, satellites doing much higher precision imagery from lower, lower satellite uh, orbits and open that kind of data up to all kinds of different new applications. In 2014, Google bought them brought the team in, including Johnny, and Johnny is still at Google right now, and he is tuned into this space like nobody else. And so what we're going to have here is have him come up, and he's going to give his hit on the kind of story of what's happening in this field right now. He's going to do it in the presentation here. I'm going to come up after that and just interview him a little bit more to tease out some of the current challenges they're wrestling with, and then we're going to roll into a conversation with all of you and kind of leverage the expertise we have here, including starting with Ed Liu here, one of the two astronauts here who is also going to start to kind of compare the, the old and the new and where are we actually going and the opportunities that are opening up now. So with that, let's get Johnny up here to kind of explain what the hell is happening in the space, space right now in the valley. <laughs> All right, thanks, Pete. Um, one real quick point of clarification, because some of the Skybox founders are actually here. Um, I actually wasn't a founder, but I was brought in fairly early, and I, I, it, wouldn't, it would not do justice to them if I said I was a founder, so I wanted to clarify that real quick. Okay, so um, I think to kind of understand where we are, I'm, I'm a history buff. I think you've got to understand a little bit about what's happened before. Um, and so I'm going to kind of try and tell that story from two different perspectives. One perspective is a very macro perspective um, in terms of the, the space industry as a whole going back to the 60s. And the other is a little bit of my personal kind of journey through um, the more recent stuff going on in the space world, especially in the Bay Area and, and some of the Silicon Valley inspired companies. Um, so we'll start real quickly with the beginning. And a lot of you know this. I'm sorry if I'm repeating. But space really started as sort of a wartime imperative. You know, in the, in the 50s and 60s, there was extreme paranoia about um, kind of the security of the United States. We went from a place of having two large oceans protecting us and insulating us from the rest of the world to suddenly uh, a place where a missile could reach us from across the world and, and destroy our civilization. So this is kind of a fundamental tectonic shift in our viewpoint. And the same technologies that enabled that sort of weapons technology also started giving us access to space. Um, this rolled into kind of the 60s where this now became kind of a, pr a primary focus um, of our country's effort and a primary indicator of sort of national prestige and capability. And the most visible of that is obviously the Apollo mission where we landed on the moon. But there were many other things that went on during that time that are, are incredible in hindsight, all powered by this kind of paranoia of um, the nuclear arms race and the Cold War um, from the, the Corona program, which is an incredible story that I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, to our first planetary, planetary explorations with the Mariners, to the first weather satellites that, you know, is kind of an unsung hero of a lot of modern life and our ability to forecast weather. Um, so one thing I want to point out really early on is that there's kind of, you know, there's a lot of talk in Silicon Valley about the space startups and what's going on in this area. 
Um, Silicon Valley is not new to space. In fact, in a lot of ways, space put Silicon Valley on the map. Um, and I've got a couple examples here. So this is a, a fascinating picture that was just declassified about five years ago. So this is Hiller Aircraft's research center in Palo Alto, either Palo Alto or Menlo Park. It's not clear. I, I can't get a good reference on that. But um, it turns out, who's been to Hiller Aircraft Museum in San Carlos? Okay. So Hiller was an interesting guy for a lot of reasons. He built a lot of helicopters and other weird aircraft. It turns out his research center in Palo Alto was actually a cover for the CIA mission to build Corona satellites. So they built the very first spy satellites in his research center in Palo Alto. Um, that later grew into what I have on the bottom, which is um, the Hexagon system, which was like our last film-based um, uh, satellite reconnaissance system. And these were all built in sunny or integrated in Sunnyvale. There, there used to be a humongous industry in Sunnyvale, Lockheed's um, facility that did basically all of the national spy satellites. Um, another really good example is uh, the top pictures are Fairchild uh, Semiconductor's very first integrated circuits. Um, it turns out the only original customer for these and, and, and the one that really kept Fairchild afloat for a while was NASA for the Apollo guidance computer. So these parts, all the parts they could produ produce originally were targeted at the, the NASA Apollo missions. Um, so as time rolled on through the 60s and into the 70s, you know, it went from this being sort of this existential government need to people realizing there's things you can do to make money in space. Um, and the very first examples of that were the communication satellites. Um, Intelsat was sort of the first geosynchronous communi communication satellite that was launched for commercial purposes. Uh, we started doing land imaging with the Landsat series. These are all still, uh, the Landsat is a government mission, but a lot of the data is used commercially for many purposes, including agriculture and other things. The first, the first real sophisticated weather satellites, operational weather satellites, started to be launched in the 70s, the, the GOA series. And then probably something that people are most intimately familiar with, although you don't realize it you know, every day, are the GPS satellites begin getting launched in the, in, the, in the 70s. And obviously, all of these things kind of um, foreshadow something that we take for granted in our daily lives today, global communications, um, sort of precision agriculture, uh, weather forecasting, and, and GPS localization. So 70s is really where that started to take off. Um, and then we had the 80s and 90s. And the 80s and 90s were really interesting for a number of reasons, because this idea that you could do something of commercial value really caught hold. And people got really excited about it. And some really big companies um, got excited about this. And investors put a lot of money into a set of systems to build global satellite communications networks. Um, Iridium is probably the most visible of these. There was also Global Star, which both are still operating in Orbcom. Unfortunately, for a number of reasons, none of these things ended well, <laughs> as many of you may remember. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, you know, some of them are kind of macroeconomic. They all ran into the big dot-com burst and, and sort of the economic contraction. Um, but there was also some, some, some problems. They, they all took much longer and cost a lot more money than anybody expected. And they were in a race against terrestrial infrastructure. So essentially, they were um, trying to beat cell networks to the, to the business. And essentially, they lost. Um, and so there was a lot of really hard lessons that came out of the 80s and 90s and the failures. That being said, there were still some successes that should be pointed out. Um, SES, which is a, um, a Luxembourg company, launched um, Astro-1A, which was a, a very successful geosynchronous satellites. There were other geosynchronous communication satellites that were successful. The very first commercial imaging satellite was launched at the end of the 90s, Iconos. And this was opened up by a law that was passed in the late 90s that allowed commercial entities to do high-resolution remote imaging. It was a commercial success. So it wasn't all bad, but there was this kind of uh, a hangover from the 90s of, you know, how did, how did we lose all these billions of dollars? Iridium was one of the largest bankruptcies in American history at that time. Um, so I'm going to take a time out real quick just to give a little perspective on this. And this may seem obvious, um, but it turns out space is hard. I'll let you watch these videos before I can see them. So if, if you ever want to go down like a YouTube rat hole, search for launch vehicle failures. Wave. It's fantastic. Anyway, uh, the point of this is that it, you know you can go and find no end of bad stories about um, failures of space missions, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, it turns out getting to orbit takes a, a lot of energy. Um, so one way I like to think about this is the amount of energy that a satellite has in orbit is a thousand times as much specific energy as a Mach 1 aircraft has. That's a lot of energy, and it's hard to impart that much energy on a, on a satellite. Um, 
historically, just statistically, getting to space fails about 5% of the time. So you've got a 1 in 20 shot every time you launch that you're not going to make it. Um, there's, there's radiation in space that our geomagnetic field and uh, atmosphere protect us from on Earth that can wreak havoc on electronics. It makes materials degrade. And there's no RMAs. Once you send the thing up there to space, you're not getting, well, Ed came back, so I guess you, some, some <laughs> things come back. But most things don't come back when you send them to the space, so you've got to get it right the first time. Um, and so the result that's, that's really occurred over the last 50 years is there's this risk-cost spiral where um, because it's so risky, people have become uh, more averse to that risk and basically have tried to engineer out risk. And that's le led to these extremely, extremely expensive, um, very capable systems that, that take order of a decade to build and order of a billion dollars to launch. These are a couple examples. This is the most recent Landsat. I showed you the first Landsat. This is the eighth one. It's close to a billion dollars and took about eight years to build. Um, it's not just government missions that have this problem. This is a commercial satellite, Worldview 4, very similar numbers, close to a billion dollars in 10 years to, to get to space. Um, so let's just take a, another side step for a second and say, okay, well, what is this industry that's building these things? And I think this is um, some data produced about the space industry, and it's a large industry. It's, it's it, depending on how you categorize it, it's over $300 billion a year. Um, some, there's some really interesting things that jump out of this pie chart. This little slice and this little slice are the pieces of that industry that include hardware, thing, people, things that people are building to launch into space. Uh, there, there's also some of that in the government. I'm going to largely ignore the government for now. That's things like um, uh, defense and, and NASA and some other things. But for commercial, these are the chunks that really am amount to hardware that people are building. The rest of it is services and then consumer hardware, things like the GPS in your phone or your satellite TV receiver. So the vast majority of the economy of space is really surrounding the services that these systems provide or things to connect to them on the ground, which is just interesting to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward and think more about this. Um, so the other thing that I want to talk a little bit about the industry is sort of the culture of the industry and how it's developed over time. So this plot is um, sort of one way to think about sort of the trade-off between innovation and risk aversion or, or, or kind of maturity in an industry. And I'll start with medical. If you think about medical, medical has to be very mature and risk averse because people's lives are at stake. Um, and for that reason, it takes a long time to innovate in medical. It can take many, many years to get FDA clearance to release a product. Um, it makes things move slowly. And so the innovation access is not very good. Automotive is a little bit better in terms of innovation. They move a little bit faster, but still people's lives are at stake. There's huge supply chains they're worried about. So again, um, a little bit slow in terms of innovation. And then you have things like consumer electronics, which move very, very, very fast. Um, and they do have mature processes in a lot of place, but there's more emphasis on innovation than there is on risk. Um, if you look at space in the early days, it actually had a pretty large dynamic range. There was, um, I'll, I'll tell a very specific story, I'll go back to Corona again. So Corona, the spy satellites I mentioned that were built in Palo Alto, um, when they first started building those, they launched the first 15 satellites in 18 months. So they launched 15 launches with 15 satellites in 18 months. The first 14 failed. So it wasn't until the 15th satellite that they launched in 18 months that they had a success. That's a very Silicon Valley-like mentality to development. Um, there was also a lot of conservatism in other places like the manned space program where you know, failure was not an option, but there was a large dynamic range of this. And what's happened really over the last 50 years is this, this industry has become more and more risk averse, less and less innovative, and it's kind of shrunk up to where it really looks in a lot of ways like the medical field. Um, okay, so what happened after this big burst in the 80s and 90s was there was sort of this kind of grassroots reboot. Um, and a few things came out of it. So one was this idea of CubeSat. So CubeSats really came out of university programs where they were trying to tra train the next generation of aerospace engineers. And they um, were very interested in finding ways for students to build real hardware and fly it rather than just do studies or talk about things. And so there was a group at Stanford and a group at Cal Poly that wrote a standard that said, if you build to this sort of form factor, um, you, you know, we'll call it a CubeSat and then you can launch it easily. And the whole mentality was, rather than doing all the, the detailed analysis and testing that you would do normally with a major space program, let the students take risk because they didn't have much choice, they didn't have very much money. And then a bunch of these guys got rides on launch vehicles and flew and some of them worked. So that was one thing that happened. Another thing that happened was SpaceX. SpaceX should not be undervalued in this discussion. They were founded in 2002, and they proved in 2008 that a commercial company could build a successful, a commercially successful launch vehicle. Um, I have another example here. This is Surrey. Uh, Surrey is a, a British company. 
that was actually came out of a lot of similar philosophy that CubeSat. It was a university-based effort that grew into an actual commercial company that started building these much smaller, cheaper spacecraft that um, you know had more risk in them, used a lot of commercial technology and parts, but um, still tended to work and, and provided value. And so the idea here that really started to kernelize was um, you start small and simple and, and be, be willing to take risks, which the industry at the time really was not uh, doing. Um, and so I'm going to now jump over to my personal kind of journey for a second because this is about the time that, that you know, I was kind of in high school and then college and th that was kind of what was in the air at this time. And so I, like Pete said, blew a lot of stuff up in my backyard and then eventually decided it was more fun to try and get it to go in one direction and built rockets. And, um, and so I spent a lot of my kind of misspent youth building fire things. Um, but I learned a lot. You learn a lot building rockets, it turns out. And then I got to Stanford, and at the time I kind of felt like the, the whole industry, I, I loved aerospace, but I felt like the industry was not going anywhere. So I focused a lot more on energy systems and robotics, which turned out to be very valuable later on. Um, until I got an internship at SpaceX my junior year. And um, so these are kind of funny pictures I'll talk a little bit about. So this picture right here, I'm in the back right there, I'm an intern. Uh, there was about 40 people at SpaceX when I started here. This was right before we tested the first stage, the first, basically the first integrated Merlin that ever got tested on the test stand. I was in Texas, because I'm from Texas, so I was at the test site. Um, this picture right here was my sort of second internship, uh, where as an intern, there was 50 people at the company at this time, they told me my job was to figure out how to use this pyrophoric liquid, which uh, for those of you who don't know what pyrophoric means, it means ignites on contact with air. Um, <laughs> figure out how to handle this so that we can light our rocket engines with it. And that was my summer project. And so um, here I am in an aluminum suit getting ready to load this stuff. And this is, this is what it looks like when you squirt it out of a pipe. Um, and just to prove that I was actually really important to SpaceX at that time, here's a picture of me with Elon. So there's Elon, and uh, he kind of crowded me out. But... Um, and then I also spent a summer at SpaceX, or at uh, Blue Origin, I'm sorry. I, they, they were very secretive at the time, so I don't have any pictures. Um, okay, so that's kind of that was like my personal journey. I went I, at Stanford. I started after this after my tours at SpaceX and Blue Origin. I actually got very very interested in um, in aerospace again. Went back, started doing research in the aerospace lab. Ran into a group of folks um, in the aerospace lab and some other places that were trying to do the Stanford Lunar X project. And for those of you that don't know what the Google Lunar X Prize was, very briefly, it's a, an X Prize for a team to go and launch and land a, a probe on the moon. And I got kind of peripherally involved in this, met a bunch of the people. Long story short, the project fell through, but a group of the people that were involved in this project went out and founded Skybox. Um, and Skybox, I have the original business plan, thanks to Finnick over here, he's smiling. Uh, originally called Terralytics, by the way, a terrible name. Um, the, the mission of this was really to take all this work that had been happening with the CubeSat industry and the small sats and the, the greater availability launch and try and build a constellation of imaging satellites for several orders of magnitude cheaper than people were doing at the time and make that data, as Pete said, much more available to people. And I actually have, this is a picture of one of their in early investors holding an early model of the SkySat, which will be funny to see when you see the later models of the SkySat. So these, are the, these were the actual founders of Skybox. Um, they hired me as kind of their third employee, um, basically to build the core team uh, that, that ended up building the actual spacecraft. And there's some great pictures that I won't spend too much time on. This is one of our very early prototypes of a satellite hanging from the roof. Um, this is us five testing some things. And remember that little thing the investor was holding? Well, this is what it, holding this is actually what it became. So um, that was our first satellite. Um, we eventually launched. Uh, this is probably one of the greatest nights of many of our lives when we got the first image back from the satellite. Um, this is my favorite picture we ever took. This was... Um, the riots in Kiev in, I think, 2014. Um, and we happened to fly over and take a picture right after a bunch of rioters set buildings on fire, so you can see the building smoking. I think that's an incredibly powerful example of what this kind of thing can do. And we were also the first to take videos, so here's some videos from the satellites. I won't dwell on these for too long. Um, okay, so out of this has kind of come a rebirth now, where not only Skybox, that was my particular example, but a lot of others have shown that you can take these principles of start small and simple and really do things that are value, valuable with them. And the payoff has been that we now have a bunch of useful systems in, in space um, and more coming that were developed much faster and much cheaper. And eventually, in our case, um, the tech giants started taking notice. And I think 
we'll see if we see more of this. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of rumors about what some of the other major players in the Valley are thinking about this, but they clearly have taken note of the fact that you can do these systems in a way that's different than the, tr the traditional industry. Um, so this is another just perspective on kind of where we're at in this whole progression. So this is um, a plot of the number of satellites in low Earth orbit um, as a function of time. And I have two. I have one with and without CubeSats. For, there's, there, the only reason to show that there's a, a lot of these are CubeSats. Um, but, you know, this, this is kind of the timeline. You can see when some of the early space companies were founded, and there's really an inflection point here, and it's kind of on an exp exponential growth rate right now. Um, so what is this new space industry? Um, when you hear of Space 2.0, it can mean a lot of different things. What I think it means is it's sort of missions that are being done outside the traditional aerospace industry. It's largely commercially funded rather than by the government. Um, and and the, the culture is very Silicon Valley inspired in terms of taking risks and agility. Um, and I have a list of a bunch of some of the companies you may have heard of that are in the Valley or other places that kind of comply with that, that description. Um, and so you remember this plot that I showed a minute ago. I really think the Space 2.0 is really trying to get back to roots in a lot of ways. It's really trying to get back to where um, we're innovating in space again. And that's really exciting. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out real quickly is that there's a lot of space is a very, um, you know, just saying space is a very broad topic. There's a lot of people doing a lot of different things in space. Um, and the time horizons that people are investing in can be from very quick, you know, uh, uh, plays to sort of capture existing markets to, you know, like the asteroid mining stuff that people are talking a lot about that realistically could take centuries to fully materialize, right? So the time horizons are very different. The, the value that people are chasing is very different. Um, so it all kind of exi exists on a spectrum. And I think it's, it's useful to keep this in mind when you, when you hear about something that somebody's talking about in space. Like, how hard is what they're, what, what are they saying they're going to do? Are they saying that they're going to fundamentally create a new market? Or are they just talking about disrupting an existing market? Are they talking about something that can be developed and deployed in a few years? Or is it something that may take decades or centuries to do? Because a lot of things that people are talking about may take decades or centuries to actually accomplish. So what's new? Um, and why, what's kind of enabled this? So hardware for space has gotten e easier. There's no doubt about that. The barrier to entry to build any hardware um, has gotten much, much lower. There's uh, much more availability of hardware, it's faster, it's easier to get access to, it's easier to develop for. Um, there's much more launch availability, so it used to be very difficult to get a ride on a rocket, now it's become fairly easy. I mean, easy as long as you have the money. Um, and there's a lot of capital available, so there's a lot of people in the valley pumping money into this right now. So what's not different? What's, what, what are the constraints that still exist? So space is still hard. If you look at a lot of these systems, a lot of them are still failing. In my opinion, this is my opinion, but I think there's a lot of lessons that the, the old industry has to offer that are not being um, fully looked at and are probably undervalued. Um, time, so there's, this is very typical for you know, this kind of thing, but it takes longer and it's harder than people think. And so um, hardware takes time to build, space turns out to be even harder than hardware, it takes more time. And then a lot of these things really are relying on building these deep vertical enterprise businesses which can take themselves decades to fully develop. Um, and so new markets, I think there's good argument to say that for these companies that are trying to go in and capture a portion of an existing market, there's some existence proof. SpaceX has clearly proven you can be profitable doing that. But there's yet to be a real strong existence proof that you can create an entirely new market from space assets. And I think that's something that'll be interesting to see over the next few years if that occurs. And so I'll leave you with this. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and you know, I, I think Pete and I talked a little bit about this and where we are on this curve is an interesting question. Uh, this curve has been debunked in a lot of ways, but I still think it's an interesting context for all of this. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that there's a bit of a bubble right now and that we're probably kind of in the frothy part of this curve. Um, but the good news is that in all of these cases, what ends up coming out of a bubble that even if it bursts is some useful capability into the future. So I think the really exciting part of this is that um, there's a lot of proof points now that you can do things differently in space. There's a lot of systems that going up that will be valuable long term and provide utility. And um, I think it's fundamentally changing uh, the way people are thinking about um, what's possible. So that, that's the exciting part of this. And um, I think with that, I can bring Pete back up here. Wow.
Woo. Not a bad start for a discussion, I'll tell you. A lot of food for thought, certainly for those of us outside the space. Um, well, let's, okay, oh, we lost the, the, the hype thing here. Well, I can one go one of, one of, no, that's fine. Well, I, well, we don't have to. That's it. All right, let's keep it there. Because one of the ways we framed this conversation, for those of you that were reading a, the invite and were invited to come here, was um, the dot-com kind of disruption, the VC-funded dot-com disruption of space. And though many of us here have lived through the 90s dot-com thing, um, <laughs> And so there's a lot of parallels that are really compelling for someone outside the field. I mean, the democratization of technology, the crazy amount of money that went into it, you know, there were some kind of lunatic ideas that were kind of funded, um, and then uh, did crash. But one of the great lessons was, that you kind of alluded to, was that a lot of things that seemed crazy back then are now actually turning out to be true. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to kind of think of it is like, what do you see are the fundamentals that are going to actually hold true here and 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 into the point of like so for example in the dot-com thing it's like the next generation coming off the dot-com crash you know is facebook you know amazon well amazon had been a little pre but you know google a lot of these things which are now the greatest you know the most valuable companies in the world and they're literally dominating kind of the, the global economy right now so do, do you s talk more about what you think is going to come out of this thing one way or the other yeah i mean i think there's a couple things one thing is that uh, is what i mentioned a second ago which is that i think there's a ch there's been a change in sort of um philosophy or belief in what's possible so even if there's a business crash i think people will look back at this time and say um, when, when the next opportunity arises to build something that space is useful for, they'll look to this time and say, well, we should still do things that way because it was proven to work. We've built actual technology that works in space in a way that was different than people did before. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is a lot of these systems, um, even if the businesses don't work out, satellites tend to stay up there, right? So they're not going to come crashing down on their own. And this was the case with Iridium, for instance. Iridium went bankrupt and it was bought for pennies on the dollar, and it's still operating today. So these systems are now 20, 25 years old, but they're still providing utility. They've created you know, now very profitable businesses that kind of arose from the ashes. And I think that could materialize in a number of ways. I mean, one is just the fact that, like I said, some of these big, deep enterprise businesses will take many, many years to develop. And some of the early businesses may not survive the time it takes to develop those markets, but their hardware probably will. So it's possible that, you know, over time, those markets will develop, and the hardware that's being built and launched now may actually service them in certain ways. I mean, another parallel that, just to be even draw that parallel out, was essentially the crazy amount of money that went into building out telecommunications bandwidth capacity in the late 90s. Again, it crashed, everyone lost their shirt in that space, but that was what provided the high bandwidth connections that led to the next generation of Web 2.0 and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So it's cool that you see that there. Um, Point out to us, you touched on some of these new companies that you see most interesting, but for we'll talk about the ones that you think are the most promising and the ones that you think might uh, might really kind of be the ones that will kind of hold over the time here. Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, well, or just even just a few examples for folks that might not have as much tune or are not as tuned in. Of who sure. Would you be, who are you watching down there that actually is some of the most interesting companies? So, I mean, I guess the way I would answer that is I think that um, if I were – a new company in this space trying to start off, uh, I would be looking at ways um, to kind of get through the valley of death, right? So when you build these systems, as I said, they take longer and they're harder to build than you ever think they would be when you start. And so I think you have to have a strategy that involves um, making money before you can achieve your full vision. And um, so I, without being specific about particular companies, I think the ones that will succeed are the ones that have struck a very fine balance between um, doing enough to make money and get through kind of the valley of death and allow themselves to scale and develop the, the longer term vision um, without losing their ability to innovate. And that's a really difficult challenge, but I think those are the ones that will in the end be successful. Well, so that's kind of straddling the, the discussion you said, which is meaning you have to kind of maybe disrupt an existing market that you could kind of grab a share of that market with an idea towards building a new market over time? Is yeah. that, would that be the and one? And that, that's think essentially that? what SpaceX has done, right? So SpaceX r w uh, disrupted the essentially the existing global launch market, and most of their business today can be classified as having been eroded from other launch providers around the world. But now they're starting to expand into other areas. They're talking about communication con constellations, things like that, that are, um, you, you could argue, are sort of new markets. But in the meantime, they're profitable, and they have something to kind of feed the beast.
And I think that's, um, you know, for these, these very resource intensive long term bets, I think that's what's critical. What are the kind of new, when you say new markets, again, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, we can understand, you know, what disrupting the old markets sure. are. But what, what are the things that you see are the kind of emerging markets that you would expect things to actually yeah, I mean the, congeal the, in the next kind of 10 years? I mean, so? the obvious example I'll use because it's very familiar to me is, is sort of the market that Skybox was chasing, which is essentially using data collected from space um, in ways that had never been used before by enterprise. So um, in other words, most large companies wouldn't think to um, go and buy satellite imagery to do something with it. But if you can provide them an answer to a problem that their business has to solve, a supply chain problem, um, a security problem, a financial problem, a macroeconomic problem, um, they'll buy that data, you know, no problems at all. So I think um, those markets don't exist today in the sense that satellite data is not used to solve many of those problems. But it, er, there's, it's widely agreed to that it could solve many of those problems. It's just there's a lot of, you know, kind of work to go from it could to it will. And there's these long cycles to get the big players in enterprise that would use this data comfortable with the quality of the data, reliability of the data, what it means to them, things like that. So um, I think that, you know, again, Skybox's strategy was very much this. It was initially go attack the existing Earth imagery market, which was a reasonable market but not huge, but long term, go find all these other places you can use that data that nobody had thought about using that data before. Interesting. And then what do you make of the kind of the long term, like the asteroid mining kind of things? And, and, and given that it's going to take so long to get there, is there money going into that now? And, and, and what's the play there if you're not going to get some? I mean, there create is. That f how do you get through that gr valley of death with that kind of long term kind this of thing? This would be a good time to talk to Ed here. Okay, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, there is thoughts. there has been some there's been some money that's gone into that. Um, at the Valley of Death for asteroid mining is a large valley. Um, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, the, the, the reason people are interested in asteroid mining is because, you know, a single asteroid can have trillions of dollars of resources, right? But it's not easy to get an asteroid back to mine it. Um, so I think it would, it would take a very particular type of investor that is willing to invest over that time scale to, to reach that goal. Now, you mentioned the biggies, uh, the role of what well, Google bought. Skybox, but I mean, it's also kind of curious to an outsider like, you know, Elon Musk is, you know, SpaceX and Jeff Bezos is into Blue Horizon. And, and what is it about the, the folks associated with the big tech companies' interest in space? Is, are there commercial synergies there that or, or economic potential they're looking at, or are they just space nerds and they want to kind of start they're playing just that space game? Space nerds. Seriously. <laughs> well, so talk, well, I mean, say, I think, say more about that. I think. Um, Certainly, I mean, I, I don't know, know them well, I've met them both, but like Elon and Jeff, I think both of them are fairly, you know, clear that their primary purpose of investing and being part of this is sort of very long-term, big-picture vision of where humanity needs to go more than anything else. And I think they've looked for a commercial sort of uh, sustainable business route to getting there. But in both cases, their end goal is the furtherment of humanity's exploration of space and um, in the universe. I mean, that, they're pretty clear publicly about that. Um, I think there's, you know, there are others in the, in the tech industry that probably are motivated by similar things, but also are interested in what the business, specifically just the business potential um, is in space. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the motivation comes out of just this kind of, like me, childhood interest in um, exploring and what you can do in there. So is the industry, though, dependent on kind of uh, crazy billionaires who like space and, I mean, and kind of I mean, ideas of kind of that kind of risk taking? Or do you think you can actually get hard nosed economic kind of VC type folks to say this is a great opportunity, let's play? I think it, or I is mean, it a balance? I'm just curious how that I plays I think there's out. a bit of both. I mean, I think there's probably definitely good business opportunities. Um, but I think, like, as you alluded to, there's probably a lot of things getting invested in that are not great business opportunities in the long term. So I, I think that a lot of the um, excitement right now is really being fueled by these kind of visionary billionaires. But I do think there will be real businesses that come out of the investment that's going in. So... One of the things I've been interested in is as these entrepreneurs are shaking up the space and as the kind of biggies and particularly philanthropy, not, not philanthropy, the billionaires are kind of moving that way, 
Has it shaken up the government-funded space? Is it making that more ambitious? Is it getting new energy in there? Is it is it sh is there anything happening inside? And uh, maybe we'll talk to Ed here in a minute. About yeah, that. no, I, I mean that's but a good I'd question. Be curious. Yeah, yeah, there's the, it's definitely caught both the traditional industry and the government um, it got th got their attention in a great way. I think um, if you go to Lockheed, if you go to Raytheon, if you go to the traditional big uh, sort of defense contractor. Um, aerospace companies today, you will find they all have a program in small sats now. They all have a program in figuring out how to utilize commercial parts for space missions. The challenge for them is that um, they're just fundamentally structured in a way that makes them very difficult to go down that path. But there is, they're essentially getting pushed that direction by the government who's now seen what's possible, um, kind of basically uh, based on what the likes of SpaceX and Skybox and Planet and Spire and these companies that have arisen out of the valley have done. There's definitely an awareness of that. Now clearly kind of Silicon Valley generated all this juice on, you know, information technologies and, you know, the digital revolution. But would you say since 2000, is there a kind of a, what's the attraction of, let's say, your generation of entrepreneurial technical energy is it, is you see the space is becoming an increasingly attractive space oh, yeah. that's going to suck a lot more energy and a lot more talent into that space? Yeah, I think for sure. I mean, the, the, when I grew up in high school, I mean, the things that we could look to for inspiration in space were NASA, essentially. That was basically it. And then we could look at the bankruptcy of Iridium and say, why would I would be, want to be involved in something <laughs> like that? Um, I think, you know, and we actually, we have invited some Stanford, the Stanford, um, space initiative, some Stanford students here tonight, so it'd be interesting to hear from them, but I think they have a lot more very publicly available um, inspiration to look to. Um, I mean, just the Falcon 9 heavy launch that had was the second largest YouTube streaming event in the history of YouTube. I mean, like, how can that not be inspirational for um, kids that are in high school or college now? So you are relatively, I mean, you've accomplished a lot, but you're relatively young in your career. I mean, when you really think of your career going out 40 more years or something, and your lifetime potentially going across the century. I mean, what do you think you're going to see as milestones out there in terms of space? I mean, what's your kind of realistic but still kind of longer term vision of what you're going to see in your career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, one thing that I personally would really like to see is um, a much better relationship of the government space program with the commercial space world. Um, I think for a long time they've existed um, on very different trajectories and in some ways in some ways they're converging but in a lot of ways they're even diverging with a lot of the stuff going on in Silicon Valley. I think the, re the only realistic way to accomplish some of these really, really big goals in space is through government investment. There's just the time horizons and the um, you know, the, the risk profiles and everything that need to be kept up to do that um, are very difficult for invest commercial business investors to, to tolerate. So I think there needs to be a, a tighter relationship and ecosystem of innovation in the commercial sector that's leveraged and invested by, by the government long term if we really want to see, you know, men return to the moon and eventually go on to Mars, um, things like that, the really the big visionary humanitarian things in space. But, but uh, and, and I can see that relationship. That's I can see that to be a goal. But, it, but if you think of like the moonshots or the big milestones that you will see in your lifetime, based on what you know is possible and the science and the where the technology is and where it could go, I mean, do you expect to see colonies on Mars? Do you expect to see asteroid mining? Do you expect to see? I mean, t talk about. Fill out the vision a little bit for folks that are really yeah, trying I mean, to understand that space a little bit. I mean, it's the r one of the reasons it's hard to answer is because it's very dependent on political will again, right? I mm. mean, I don't think it's going to be driven entirely sort of through a grassroots um, Silicon Valley model. I think it has to be, in the governments have to be involved. So it's kind of hard to predict, right? Um, I think it's very possible that we'll see men return to the moon in my lifetime. I would love to see, if Elon has his way, we'll see men on Mars in our lifetime. Um, but there's some really, really big challenges that have to be solved, not only technical, but also, you know, or organizational and financial if that's going to happen. And, and right now, it's not exactly clear how those pieces would fall into place to see that. I think we will see an explosion in um, the utility and number of systems that are being launched for commercial purposes in space over our lifetime. And I think in many ways what will happen is um, there will be systems that today seem totally transformational and we probably can't even hardly imagine, like GPS, which before it came about, people would think it was fantasy, that 
you know, in 30 or 40 or 50 years, we just completely take for granted and it sits in our pocket. Um, but it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to predict what those will be. I got you for that kind of long time. Well, I think, I'll tell you what, this is a great point. We got so much brain power and so much experience in this room. This is a good time, I think, to kind of open it up here. And what, what I want to do is, is start with Ed Liu here, um, who is executive director of, I guess you, you call it the B612 uh, Asteroid Institute. This is a nonprofit that is out to protect Earth from asteroids. They're the folks that are keeping us from being dinosaurs, like the dinosaurs folks. So we got to owe them a lot of credit here. Hopefully we can keep us safe here. But wh what's nice about you, I think you've been in space three different times. You've kind of grew up, you were in, rooted in that other industry uh, or that other paradigm. And uh, you're now connected with this whole next generation like, like Johnny's. And y y why don't you start with a few reflections on well, how do you feel about the potential right now? And, What's exciting to you, and where do you think we can go with this right now? Do you want to stand up and just, uh, and then we'll roll into every other people's First off, thoughts. First off, I thought that was a great presentation, and uh, I, when I first came to, uh, when I left NASA, which was 2007, I, I came out to work at Google, and uh, it, it struck me that there was an awful lot of things that, that Google could learn from NASA, and the reverse. And one, one of the things that, one of the phrases I like that people used to say at Google was, launch early, launch often. And, and I've been on a, a warpath with my old friends at NASA, trying to get them to begin to adopt some of that mentality that just get something flown and then iterate on it. Just get it in space, try it. Don't analyze it for 10 years. If you can fly something in three years, and then build three more versions of it, that's way better than analyzing it for 10 years and trying once with a really expensive system. And I think that's beginning to take hold. Um, it's definitely taken hold here in uh, you know, the kind of companies that you mentioned, Skybox, for example. Um, and I, I think that's great. What do you, I mean, we, we, he was talking, he was deferring to you a couple times in, in conversations here. Um, the asteroid, Space. I mean, obviously, you're devoting yourself into this space. W where do you see? What do you see as the potential out there? But or the or the danger? Or how much? What What's the energy to get us to really tune into what is an amazing scene out there? Well, it's the it's the frontier, right? If you if you look at where people are going to go next, over the next fifty hundred couple hundred years. It's going to be the inner parts of our solar system. It's not going to be out to Pluto or things like that, but it's going to be the area around Earth. So that's going to include Mars, Earth, the Moon, and, and, and the general area around that. And if I look at that, that I mean, to me, that seems like a, a you know, it, it's way off on the right-hand side of the chart you had earlier of long-term stuff. But if nobody tries for that, we're just never going to get there. And it takes, it takes crazy people, and it takes government support. Those are the two things that that invest for the long term, right? The typical investor is investing on a sub 10 year horizon, right? Who invests for a 30 year horizon? Crazy people, philanthropists, uh, and governments. And I think it's gonna happen because I think that the pieces are coming together because of the people investing for the short term. The people investing in the short term are building the systems to make rockets easier, the systems to make rockets cheaper, the systems to make satellites cheaper and more effective. All that's happening, the electronics behind that and uh, is all happening and that is going to, you combine that with a few crazy people um, and, and we're gonna get there. So both of you have kind of raised this idea of needing political will or government backing or long-term investments. To what extent are the dangers of hey, we might get hit with an asteroid, it's over, or climate change, which is starting to increasingly freak out people. I mean, to what extent can those fears essentially help generate a kind of a sustained energy into this if we can't get people to just go because, hey, we just need to get up there and it's awesome? I think fear works well in the short term. It doesn't work well in the long term. Okay. I mean, we, we saw, for instance, what happened, you know, Rusty, you were heavily involved in this fear in the short term in the 60s led to the Apollo program, but, but you could finish that program in nine years, right? Um, fear doesn't work well on a 50-year time scale or a 100-year time scale as we see with climate change. It just doesn't work very well. And the same thing is, I think, true for, for the risk of asteroid impacts, which are, you know, the, the typical length of time between a nuclear weapon-sized uh, 
explosions on Earth from asteroids is decades. And, uh, you know, so the next uh, really large one, you know, large enough to wipe out a city, it's probably 100 years or more out. Right, the last big one was in 1908. So that's a time scale which fear I don't think works really well. Uh, so I think it's got to be inspirational in order to get us to go do those types of projects that take that long. And so when you see this last regeneration um, of the last, as, as you mentioned, kind of the post.com, the 2000s, we're kind of the last 15 years, how does that make you feel? Are you, are you energized? Are you optimistic? Are you feeling like, hey, we're, on, we're, we're starting to claim space back again? Or are you feeling like we still <laughs> got a lot more to go here? I, I think it's great. Um, I think we've seen more progress in the last 10 years than, than we had in the 10 years previous to that. And uh, I think it's accelerating. You know, you look at that chart of the number of spacecraft in Earth orbit, it is, it's not a straight line climbing up and to the right. It's curving upwards, and it's curving upwards fast. And we're looking at an explosion of interesting things happening in space, starting with the area around the Earth, and I think moving out to the area, uh, you know, in the Earth's vicinity around the sun. And last question for you two, and then let's, we're going to open it up here. So, th folks, think about how you want to add to this conversation. But um, we've talked about the valley, the Bay Area. What's going on in the rest of the world? I mean, is a similar thing happening in other countries? I mean, how much is the global piece of this part of this? puzzle right now and to what extent is this getting mirrored in other places or is this an yeah. aberration or is it kind of the front edge of this or put us in global context yeah bit. I mean it's definitely going on to varying extents throughout the world there are groups there are companies that have been started in South America and Europe that are doing similar things with for instance small satellites in space um, uh, the, the only other privately fully privately funded launch vehicle company that's been successful to put something in orbit is Rocket Lab which is in New Zealand um, so it's definitely a global phenomenon, um, and I think we must have a, a Rocket Lab fan back there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I mean, the Valley is the most visible, and it's the highest concentration of capital, blah, 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 but it's definitely something that's going on around the world. You too? Are you encouraged? Yeah, absolutely. Globally? It, it's, it's not just here. Sometimes we get our in, you know, self-involved with our own little bubble here, and we think everything is around us, and it's not. Good to know. Let's open it up to folks here. Uh, Folks, what did you make of this? Uh, if, if you want to, yeah, if you want to sit down, we got two mics here. It is being live streamed. We're editing the whole thing. Uh, we're going to edit it later. So, we've got a woman here who I know is also tied into the space industry. And um, just if you could stand up, say your name and kind of your association if you have some in this space, particularly, and uh, make a comment or ask a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Rachel Clemens. I'm uh, in the business. I'm in the business development team for Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, and we manage the National Lab on the International Space Station. Um, so I'm very. I, my organization is very much on the interface between government and commercial entities. So this conversation about time horizon, your you know the trough of disillusionment with space flight is a lot longer than the dot com bubble burst, right? Um, and that can be a lot more disillusioning to people. And uh, given that political will can be very fleeting, which Ed also touched upon, and it seems to me that the government and private industry are not really working together at all right now. I mean, not, not to, I'm not like, not to like put you on the spot, but even when you presented your pie chart, you were like, oh, and then this, I'm not even gonna talk about that, right? Uh, the whole quarter of your pie chart, which is fine, um, but uh, <laughs> but how can how can this the government, given that they have deep pockets, but their will is fleeting, and commercial industry is driven by markets and demand and everything, how can they work better together in the space sector? Sure. Um, so I mean, one thing that th th is definitely a problem. Um, there are some incentive problems with the government working well with some of these new commercial entities. Specifically, um, you know, while early on, for instance, I'll, I'll take NASA as an example. Early on, the purpose of NASA had a very clear mission and goal, and the whole organization was motivated around that to accomplish essentially the moon landings. Um, in, the, in the ensuing years, what it essentially has become, and I don't mean this to sound pejorative, but in a lot of cases, it's become a make work program. I mean, there's a lot of people a lot of the decisions that are made in terms of funding NASA are around congressional districts, right? And so 
Um, there's not a lot of incentive um, from that perspective for adopting things that necessarily improve efficiency if, they're gonna, if they have the potential um, of changing the status quo in terms of where the work goes and who's getting paid to do it. So, um, you know, I, that's a difficult problem to solve. I think that um, in, in a lot of ways that has to, sort of has to be solved at the highest levels of government and, and, legislate and you know, through legislation. And that's a, it makes it even harder problem to solve given the political climate. So I don't know exactly what the answer is to that. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Any thoughts on that? Rusty, he's got his hand here. Um, let's get, uh, we've got another astronaut in the house here and he's gonna have a few thoughts. But identify yourself for those who don't know you. Um, hi, Peter, thanks. <clears throat> Great session, by the way, thank you. Uh, Rusty Schweikart, I flew on Apollo 9 um, many years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, wanted to, I wanted to make two comments um, and, and then ask uh, what, what I think is a critical question and see what you have to say about that, Johnny. Um, the, the two comments are with regard to the two people who are really turning things around entirely um, in space and in other places, namely Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, and they have different motivations, and both of them are very interesting, and I want to I uh, give kudos to both of them. Uh, with Elon, his fundamental motivation, as long as I take him for what he says, and I think uh, he's speaking, in fact, what he believes, and that is the future of humanity and uh, having a long-term future for this evolutionary process that we're all part of namely moving to the point where a multi-planet species. And that's the only way where there is a survival of the evolutionary process that we've all been a part of here on, on planet Earth. And I think that inspirational concept, that fundamental thought is a very, very powerful motivator for people. Uh, and I think uh, we really need to value that for, uh, for what it is. It is, uh, in fact, I, I see it as step two of what Ed and I and Danica have been involved in, you know, for the last 10 or 12 years, namely, you know, preserving life on this planet from asteroid impacts, in other words, not go the way of the dinosaurs, in order to enable us to get to be a multiplanetary species. So we're, I think, step one, and, and he's step two. The other guy, though, I want to give credit to is, is Jeff Bezos, who is a little more down to earth in a sense, but Jeff is very smart. And what he recognizes is that by dramatically dropping the cost of getting into space, that opens up to a whole generation of people who don't have deep pockets the capability to innovate. And we should not underestimate the power of young people innovating if the cost of access drops dramatically enough. And so those two factors, I think, are fundamental, both the idealistic and the cost effectiveness of those two guys being involved now. Now I want to switch gears and go to a question, and it's a challenge, and it seems to me that we are confronted with a real disruptor in the development of space and all of the things that we all want by the Kessler issue of debris. We can have, frankly, a cascading degradation of the entire space environment, which makes it uninhabitable, if you will, or un, un inhabitable even by an inanimate objects, uh, if in fact we end up with a cascading debris collision creating havoc uh, in low Earth orbit. And I'm wondering what your thoughts, Johnny, are in terms of addressing that. Perhaps a little bit in prevention, but also if you'd take the next step to say that as usual in human life, we don't act responsibly ahead of time and it happens, now what do we do? So if you yeah. look at both of those. Those are hard questions. Uh, for, yeah. for, and just Actually, for people that don't know, uh, the Kessler syndrome is think uh, gravity. So it's the case where you have a collision in space that essentially forms a chain reaction 
um, and the debris you know, chain reacts and, and takes out a large portion of the objects in orbit um, and creates essentially a cloud of debris that um, is impenetrable um, for most practical purposes. And this is a real, it's a real concern. It's something that there's been a lot of work to analyze. Um, and I think that, you know, to kind of answer the first part of your question, um, I think it's incumbent upon people that are doing work in space to take responsibility for this in certain ways, right? So um, there needs to be, there's, there, there is no, today, there is no law that says thou shalt deorbit your system after some period of time. There's sort of best practices and guidance that are adhered to, um, but there's nothing that requires people to take their systems out of orbit. And I think um, until that happens, the operators need to be very cognizant of the potential impact of them not doing that and be responsible about how they manage them. Um, there's also things that can be done. I mean, obviously, limiting um, the very large, this is going to be a huge problem if SpaceX has their way and Boeing has their way and some others may have their way. Um, thousands. thousands of, so, so just for context, what people are talking about right now, I, that plot I showed, there's about a thousand spacecraft in LEO right now. Um, the baseline constellation that SpaceX is talking about for communications would be about 4,000 satellites. So four times the total number of things in orbit that we have today. Um, and the other problem with what they're proposing is they're in orbits that will not decay quickly. They'll, they will take probably hundreds of thousands of years to decay. Um, and so there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole question of kind of individual responsibility that I think has to be answered. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know exactly how, how you enforce that. Um, in terms of the worst case scenario, if there is such a chain reaction and you have to clean up space, um, I mean, in some ways, that may actually be a catalyst for innovation, right? Because suddenly, <laughs> a lot of things that we take for granted are completely gone, like global communications in a lot of cases, GPS, our ability to spy on other countries, our ability to snoop on electronic signals. All of these things are suddenly gone, and I could imagine there being a large emphasis on uh, both figuring out how to, you know, basically investing in technologies that would allow us to clean it up, which would be things like massive launch capability and, um, and new technologies for, you know, on-orbit robotic things and things like that. So um, I don't have a good, I actually have no idea how you would solve that problem beyond the fact that it would probably catalyze massive investment in kind of fundamental space technologies to go fix it. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, um, other ideas here. Let's get some folks... Um can I? Okay, we got a guy here. Let's get. Can we get in there? Uh, my name is Steve Stolper, and I've uh, done flight software for the Mars Pathfinder spacecraft at JPL and the SkySat spacecraft at Skybox. Awesome. Um, I didn't plan them though. That was. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to hear your thoughts on a second-order effect that I've seen and how it can affect the future. Um, when I broke into the industry only a select few could write flight software for a spacecraft. And they all had gray hair. And now I realize there's a causal effect there, but um, the point is <laughs> there, there are a lot of young people, even in this room right now, who have written flight software for a spacecraft. And not far down the road, we're actually going to have a, a, a a population of experienced space veterans, even the ones that are creating space debris right now. How do you think that'll affect our capability going forward? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good question. I think um, it's both an opportunity and a risk. Um, the risk is that if there is a big bubble burst, a lot of those people could get interested in something else and move on in their careers, um, especially if we don't solve this problem of how we um, unite some of the things going on in government with some of the things going on in commerce because the really long-term opportunities in the industry that will s weather bubble bursts and other things will have to in some way involve NASA and the likes of the government. So I, I keep coming back to that. Um, you know, the opportunity is that uh, because there's been so many people that have gotten a taste of this now and have kind of experienced the exhilaration of a launch and the exhilaration of, of, of getting first light from an imaging satellite. These things are kind of life-changing events. And I think it will, it does sort of fundamentally change people's perspective on what's possible and, um, and, and probably somewhat insulate uh, people from becoming too disillusioned in the future because they've had a, an experiential taste of what, uh, what can be done. Um, so I think there's, you know, it, it, it definitely provides 
an opportunity in the sense that we'll have a whole community of people that are both excited and educated in the area, but we have to make sure to con continue to feed that community and not let it expire. Is there anyone here who has an informed opinion of this or, um, that would counter this idea that we really need to engage long-term government funding on this kind of stuff? I mean, it, it, like you were alluding to the fact that what if there were the 100 Bezoses and what if, you know, you did really make it cheap to get in the space? D is it necessarily true that you would need the kind of long-term government funding that we used to have? Why couldn't it? I is there anybody that has a credible way to counter that? I'm just curious. If not, that's fine too. Bruce, here's another space entrepreneur guy. In so fact, yeah, you're, he's working on a, a commodities exchange or a way to actually finance space in yeah, a different way. Yeah, Bruce K. Ham. Yeah, let's Stanford. talk about that. Actually. So, um, explain who you are again. Okay, so Bruce K. Ham from Stanford, and I'm not a space engineer and certainly not an astronaut, but um, I come from a finance background, a uh, Wall Street background. And I started to look at how space seems to have, and, and you've talked about it really well tonight, two issues. It's got the valley of death liquidity issue and a lot of different risks. And if there were a way to visualize what you want, where you want it in the years that you'll have it there in space, you might reduce risk. You might also create some commodities for things like debris removal, a uh, kilogram of debris removal, or uh, launch obviously is becoming commodified. Imagery is becoming commodified. So, you know, we, we have terrestrial markets that function, and, and coming to Rusty's point, it isn't an, um, it isn't an accident that two of the greatest marketplace redefiners are space enthusiasts. Elon with PayPal and Jeff with Amazon. And, and these folks fundamentally rethought how markets should work. And so what I'm thinking, Johnny, is that to the extent that we want to transfer risk of space not working, we, we do these things called hedges. Um, to the extent that we want to anticipate a cluster of commodities, bandwidth and imagery and, and some other stuff appearing at the same moment in some orbit, we can do that. It was, uh, in a sense, called the Transcontinental Railroad. So, so um, you know, I think we, we have to have exploration, not just of launch and pyrotechnics, although, you know, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, we have to have some exploration of finance and hedging and market formation and, and you know, would welcome your thoughts on, on, you know, having space engineers who understand how to, how to finance what they want beyond um, going to NASA or ESA and saying, please give us a lot of money. That's fascinating. What do you think? <laughs> um, so I'm not a finance expert, so this is, <laughs> but I mean, the one, the, I guess the one thing I would say is that, um, you know, I think a, a big problem in finance is risk, right? And how you manage risk. Um, and I suspect, and I don't know this for a fact, you'd be much more equipped to answer than I would, but that um, risk is one of the biggest chi challenges in financing space because it's a very, it's a very risky endeavor and it's hard to quantify in, in, in space um, endeavors. So I think that maybe one of the ways to think about that is um, how you can essentially reduce risk and enable finance th from that perspective. And I think that a lot of the stuff going on right now is doing exactly that, right? So it's, it's essentially proving that things are possible um, in shorter periods of time for less money um, and with people that are not, have not spent 70 years in the industry. Um, so you're, you're kind of reaching somewhat more of a commoditization stage where um, to go and do something in space does not incur nearly as much risk and is more financeable. And I think that'll build upon itself over time um, is the best kind of thought I have on that. Okay. This, are there people in the back there? Because we've kind of dominated up here, although there's a, there is a hand here. Any thoughts in the back? And also, you don't have to be a total space nerd expert. You can actually be anybody with an interesting insight into space. Uh, Okay, well here, let's get Ron here. Yeah, I come from a national security background, Ron Stoll. So I've been fascinated by the concept of militarization of space and something that I worked on as part of my career. 
um, especially when the Chinese blew up a satellite and, and showed that they could do it. So do you think that that's one of the disruptors to the kind of trajectory of the industry that you've described, and that's the increased militarization of space? Um, so when you say disruptors, do you mean as having discourage discourage people oh. from following the industry path that you're doing because a lot more, mm. pardon me, the word crap, gets uh, done in the militarization part, shooting down satellites, putting up hyperkinetic vehicles. You know, there's a whole, you, you didn't deal with that sector, yeah, but yeah, there's yeah. a lot in that sector that's not just spying on each other. There's offensive space that when you think about it. So I, I, it just worries me as to whether or not it'll turn off investors and, and basically cause some conflict or, or, or changes in the trajectory of the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I don't think it's going to necessarily turn off commercial or private investors. Um, I know that there is a lot of interest in the government sector and how to utilize the capabilities that are being developed in the commercial sector right now to hedge against those risks, right? So if you have systems that are taken out in a space attack, can you, get, can you repopulate that capability very quickly, much more quickly than the traditional industry would be able to? Um, and that could, you know, potentially actually help fuel the industry to certain, to, in certain ways. Um, it's not, I don't know if there's enough general awareness in sort of the investment community about the risks associated with space warfare for them to be even really cognizant of it as a, as a business risk. Hmm, interesting. Uh, other thoughts? Anybody over here in this, we want to give every, okay, there's a guy in the way back there. And just stand up and identify yourself. Hi, my name is Paul Day. I'm a colleague of Johnny's from Skybox. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how far chemical rocketry will take us and, and what do we rely on after that? That's a good question. Uh, so um, I actually have a slide that I could show on this real quick if we want to. Sure. I don't you know. want to? It's you a, want to grab it? Just quick? a real quick background. So one of the reasons space is, let me see if, see if I can find it here. And sorry for the eye chart here. Uh, do I need to get So now math's coming out. The, ma the math, it's, it's that we time We have pop night. quiz at the end of this, folks. Yeah, we're, we're getting math. So, I mean, real quick, basically, the, the point of this slide, you don't have to read all the math, <laughs> <laughs> is that um, one, <laughs> one of the hard things about getting to space is it takes a lot of energy. And I mentioned this earlier, but um, it turns out we got really lucky. Well, in some ways we got lucky, in some ways we got unlucky to be born on Earth because we're right at the threshold, essentially, or very close to the threshold um, in terms of the strength of our gravity of being able to launch things into space with chemical propel propellant. So essentially looking at, if you look at the periodic table and how much energy chemical reactions have, um, we just like are barely able to utilize chemical reactions and liberate the energy to get stuff into space. We're very close to the edge. Um, and so that's what makes launch vehicles very difficult to develop. Um, and I like this, there's a really good uh, business insider or something article, it's a link that you guys can't get to of course, but they talk about the number of elephants per launch vehicle and you know, a launch vehicle typically is 95% propellant when it lifts off. And another way I like to think about this, if you want to put a gallon of milk in orbit, it takes something like 100 gallons of propellant, right? So it's, you end up building these very, very highly optimized, very, very um, cutting edge, expensive, high performance systems that you use once and then throw away. And Elon's trying to solve that with the reuse, you know, the reuse thing. Um, but fundamentally, you know, it just, at a certain point, you can, at, you, can, you can get a fundamental lower bound on what it costs to launch something into space if you look at what the cost of kerosene uh, to put in your launch vehicle would cost if you could reuse everything else perfectly. And it's still a relatively high number. It's not, I mean, it's, not a, it's, it's still orders of magnitude lower than what we have today, but it's still a relatively high number. So the question Paul is asking is if you get to the point where um, economically you need to do better than you can do with conventional rockets, uh, chem chemical rockets, um, I think is, is the question, what, what next then, or what do you do after that? And there's, so there's a lot of options. Um, there's not a lot of good ones. Uh, space tethers, you've probably heard of, or space elevators. Um, I, in my opinion, that's crazy people. Um, <laughs> there are options that we looked at in the 60s, including nuclear uh, energy, and nuclear energy is a much denser form of energy, so you can actually use fission reactions to power rockets to orbit. There's a lot of political problems with that, environmental problems with that. Um, so I, I mean, if I were a guessing man, we're not moving away from chemical propulsion anytime soon. Um, but there are people working on it. There was a company for a while down in Southern California working on beamed propulsion, which is essentially using 
gigantic, very high power microwave transmitters to get the energy to the rocket as it's ascending rather than having to liberate it from the propellant. Um, again, that was a case of decades or centuries to probably to achieve it, um, which is hard to do with private capital. Well, th this reminds me, by the way, you're describing, you know, pro these kind of beams and everything else. I, I was going to ask you this, and as long as I'll, I'll take a progress and slip another question in here. Is yeah. How much is science fiction really a, a motivator for folks in, in the space world, particularly your generation, uh, the next generation? I mean, for example, honestly, I... I, I, I Kim Stanley Robinson recently wrote a, a, a novel called uh, 2312. It was written in 20, 2012, 2312, about really what in existing science could you actually do in 300 years in the solar system without kind of, you know, new technologies that would take you to other galaxies, all that kind of goofball stuff. But it's fascinating how much you can actually probably do in this solar system. And it just made me, as an outsider, kind of get really tangible, like, wow, we could actually have humans on Mercury that close to the sun, using kind of ways to kind of keep yeah. the planet between us and the sun. Anyhow, a lot of things that just really kind of blew my mind. But I'm curious how much written science fiction and also uh, film, and film actually does to actually make you guys think when you're really doing your job of like, Jesus, maybe we could do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally love science fiction. Um, I grew up reading... Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov, and one of my favorite books was, uh, so now I'm going to contradict what I said a second ago, one of my favorite books was 3001 because they had all these space elevators that took you up <laughs> into orbit, <laughs> and then I was really exactly disappointed I when I finally, you know, learned the physics and realized that <laughs> it was going to be pretty hard to achieve that, um, but at the same time, you know, that got me very excited when I was young, and I think, I, I suspect that most people that work in this area um, take a lot of inspiration from science fiction, and there's some, there's Today, there, you know, we're, people think we're kind of out of the heyday of great science fiction, but there's a lot of really good science fiction being written. Neil Stevenson's great. It's very realistic. There's a lot of good stuff out there. So I think, um, yeah, I think, I think that is a, an, an influence and inspiration. I don't, uh, people out here may want to be curious. Yeah, too, who right? else has? Oh, Ed wanted to add one, add one here. Let's, oh, okay, here's a comment here from Ed. Um, we just want to stand up, I see. Okay, I just wanted to uh, add to Bruce's comment. Um, I think for the, you know, when we were talking about crazy people or governments or whatnot, I think you're absolutely right that one of the ways we really need, one of the things we really need to think about is innovation and finance, right? And, and that's figuring out a way to put a value on things that are going to happen out in the deep future. Because if you can put a value on it, then people can invest because they have an idea of what they're trying to get to. They can make a case for it, right? So, you know, even, even in things like, uh, like Rusty, your question about uh, space debris in orbit. If you can put a value on removing a piece of space debris, then there's a market for removing piece. And, 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 you know, there's no greater motivator to human beings than, you know, making a profit, right? And, and, and innovation will happen, you know. And conversely, you, you can put on a price on polluting the Earth environment so people have a disincentive to do those sorts of things that create uh, debris. So, you know, putting, figuring out a way for us to put a value to those great things that we want to do in the next century is key to all this. Well, and I think it also opens up, expands the level of innovation. You don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to be a space engineer. You could actually be a financial kind of person. Anyhow, so, you want to add to that? So I'm motivated by seeing symbols up there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We, we've actually come up with something that I call the USC, which being at Stanford is kind of awkward. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's the unit of space convenience. And the notion that there are things that if you had to do them from Earth would cost you multi multiple of what you would want them to cost you by being in space. So being on the moon, one-sixth the gravity of Earth, one sixth the fuel to get from the moon someplace else. Or, you know, Ed's, Ed's example, you know, what would it cost you or, or Rusty's to clean up the debris by launching everything from here? So we're, we're working on some version of financial theory for space. That's fantastic. Uh, apparently there's John here. <laughs> 
She was not a space person, if I understand I you. Identify uh, yourself. Yeah, I'm John O'Dan. I, I would love to go to space, but I have never actually been there. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing I'm doing my but career. But an innovator in another field, I will say. Yeah, nothing in my career has landed me on a path to go there. Um, I have a two part. One is a comment on the, what you just said, and then actually I had a question. Comment was uh, in terms of value, like a lot of these insur uh, projects to take a bit of metal and put it in space get insured. Um, is there anything that like certain insurance companies will give you a discount if you take a path that has been cleaned by somebody else? Or and I'm, I know nothing about this, so that's just a general question. So th there's not a lot of people who want to write space insurance for obvious reasons. <laughs> But the ones that do um, reduce the premium with each successful launch, right? So that's proving the, the technology risk, risk is yeah. going down. So I, I honestly, it's a good question. I haven't asked the question. Oh. Um, it's XL Catlin, so I'll make that call. Okay. okay. And we then the, oh, did yeah, you have another question? Yeah, the actual okay. question I okay. had originally uh, okay. was um, all of the topics here about being what I would call vertical launch take something on the ground and just go straight up in some, or with an arc that's carefully calculated. Um, what about the different models I've seen in terms of like what Virgin and Paul Allen are talking about, where you basically get a plane to go up to a high altitude and then drop something off that that yeah. goes up. Does that change the number of milk cartons that you use? Uh, um, no, it doesn't. It really, uh, it doesn't. And, and the best way to think about, so the, the reasons for doing air launch, there's a couple of traditional reasons that people have wanted to do this. The biggest one is a very poorly understood but large component of launch cost is what they call range cost, and it's basically, there's two places in the U.S. you can launch rockets from right now, essentially. It's Vandenberg or, or the Cape, and um, it's very costly to do so there. There's a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of overhead, essentially. So launching from an aircraft frees you from that, um, for one thing. You can also launch in any direction you want, and depending on the orbit you want, uh, you have to launch in the right direction. And so, like, the reason we have two launch areas in the U.S. is because uh, in, in Vandenberg, we launch polar satellites, and from the East Coast, we launch things that are more equatorial. Um, so aircraft are also free to launch from a lot of different, what they call azimuths. Um, the, in terms of the energy equation, it doesn't fundamentally change it exactly for this reason that most of the energy that you need to get to orbit is not going to come from drop the aircraft. Um, in other words, when you drop something off going 600 miles an hour at 30,000 feet, it has less than 1% of the energy it needs to get to space. So you still have to drop a rocket that's capable of getting to space from the ground from the aircraft when you drop it. Um, so it's, it, yeah, the, the, the altitude is not a big component. So that, again, if you look at these two, the two energies here, the green one is altitude, the red one is speed, essentially. And so you chip in a little bit to this altitude energy, the 5.5 megajoules, but you're not doing much at all with the speed. And even, even that altitude component is small. So in terms of energy that you're imparting on what you're trying to get to space, the aircraft is doing very little, essentially. All right, we're getting close to the end here, but there's a couple of questions. We'll take one here and one back there. But go ahead, stand up and identify yourself. Um, uh, Bob Hillman, I just, I'm just curious because Rusty invoked um, uh, Elon's uh, reference to humanity and what the vision is for us as human beings. And I'm so wondering what you can all inform me about in terms of the international efforts that may or may not take place or may be happening that would take something like what you were saying, Ed, you know, why, why isn't there a, a price, uh, a cost, that we, can, that we can give somebody, okay, if you can bring some junk back from space, this is what it's worth, right? So, oh, you want to launch something? Well, you can't launch something unless you take away something. Make that, you know, so somebody has to internationally cooperate in a way that we seem ineffective at, in, at cooperating internationally on any other subject. We can't get anybody in North Korea or China or, the, or Washington, D.C. to agree on anything. But maybe if we say we could shut down all of the satellites and this big hellacious thing happening with the junk that's out there, maybe we could get some cooperation, at least to find some subject we can all agree on and talk about, and, you, and at least on this planet, begin the humanitarian discussion around, okay, we have to get this junk under control. Let's commodify it. Let's get Wall Street and everybody else around to say, okay, here's what it takes. It's kind of like putting carbon credits yeah. only in space. So what, what's being done around that? Because otherwise a lot of this is I'm actually going to throw Ed under the bus on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
in terms of idea, oh no. Well, I think, I mean, I think Ed, Ed spent a lot of time thinking about this, how you put a price on, on sort of the risk of these large, you know, events happening. And I think carbon credits are probably a really good analogy. And we look at, you know, you look at even just like the Paris Accords and how much political will that took to kind of partially get, to get to a sort of partial solution. Um, for what you know, many people perceive as like the biggest risk to humanity right now. So it's I don't know. It's hard to imagine how we would motivate that amount of kind of global political real will to cooperate on something like that. Do you, you probably He's like mentioned that. prizes, yeah, as a good way. Um, by the way, if another science fiction book that was awesome about the international community coming together under pressure of threat is Neil Stevenson's recent Seventies, yeah. which is just a mind blowing. Uh, Science fiction, but it does show humanity under a deadline, getting their act together and cooperating to uh, to save the human project. Go ahead, here in the back, could you identify yourself? Hi. Let's get into the, we're getting to the end here, last few questions, go ahead. Sure, Adam Kahn. In terms of the energy equation, uh, how about using the moon as a launch pad? Is that, is that under consideration? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm really glad that my equations have paid off. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of people that have talked about the, the moon is a is a much in a lot of ways is a much better place to put things in orbit from than Earth because the gravity well is so much um, so much smaller. I mean the challenge with that is you just have to build the infrastructure on the moon to build whatever you want to put in orbit. So um, a lot of the stuff that people talk about, and this is something that's probably worth saying real quickly. A lot of the a lot of these things that are centuries out require infrastructure and require kind of sustained infrastructure building up over time, communications, the ability to get fuel, places, things like that. And I think jump-starting that is really, aside from the financing side and the long-term investment side, it's also building out this, these, these kind of rings of infrastructure around Earth that can support more and more um, uh, grandiose missions further, further away from Earth. And one would be things like establishing a presence to build and launch things from the moon. All right, folks. Oh, well, okay. We'll take one last one here, and then then we're gonna get here in the middle. Hi, Ben from Planet. Planet so, being one of these startups. Yes. Okay, for those <laughs> I, that don't know. So, as we look forward, a number of governments are talking about the moon. A number of billionaires or other uh, philanthropists, entrepreneurs are talking about the moon. How do we see? How do you see the, the ecosystem of either companies developing to provide the infrastructure needed for that? So will it be, will SpaceX go and build their own city and will Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin build their own city and provide everything? Will there be a whole ecosystem of startups that provide the utilities, the infrastructure, the habitats, the robotics, the mining? Uh, and do those companies is now the time to start those companies before like the whole chicken and egg happens? Yeah, that's what are a, your thoughts I mean, on all that? That's, that's a really hard question, yeah. I mean, I think, again, it comes back to this question of um, uh, valuing or pricing the long-term thing. You want to base on the moon, and you can show that that's worth a lot of money once you get there. What are all the steps and infrastructure you have to put in place to get to that point? And, um, there's a huge, again, it's the, there's this valley of death. If I go and build a communication network to support the base on the moon, how do I make money with that until there's a base on the moon, right? And I think that, um, you know, one way to solve that is long-term sustained government investment. Another way maybe is in um, innovation in financial markets that allows you to, to, to place a value on that and make money in the interim. But I think you have to solve that problem of, um, we have this long-term goal that we want to get to. Um, there's 10 steps between here and there. How do we sustainably build out the infrastructure? And sustainably is key because I, I, I want to point out, go back to something that was said earlier about Apollo too. Apollo was amazing. You know, it was this incredible program um, that did, you know, was one of the most impressive accomplishments of mankind. But then it ended. And we weren't left with a whole lot after it. I mean, we were left with industrial base and know-how, but we weren't left with a sustainable infrastructure that could continue taking us to the moon or continue working on larger and grander missions. And I think that's really gonna be the key if we wanna do these big things, is building out sort of rings of sustainable infrastructure that can feed themselves to enable bigger things. Well, I tell you, I think that's a good way to wrap here. I will say one final 
science fiction is the guy who wrote The Martian, his latest book is Artemis. It's about basically a commercially based moon base, and uh, it's another great read. So um, we got through, we got plenty of science fiction going here. Anyhow, we're going to basically wrap it up here. The poor guy in the Reunion Island has got to get off his breakfast <laughs> and uh, get to work. And uh, the rest of us have to actually go for another drink, more food, more drink, more conversation. But let's end this with uh, giving Johnny Dyer an amazing hand. Ah. Uh, great conversation. <laughs>